Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. So uh, this is Family Life. So we're going to start out today with getting up and, because we're family, right? We're family in Christ. So we're going to get up and meet somebody you haven't met. So if everybody wouldn't mind standing up and going around. Okay, guys, if everybody doesn't mind retaking their seats very quickly. Okay. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We are so glad that you've come to worship with us today. Here are just a few things to know. Tonight is Acro Flyers Home Show. All are invited to watch the team perform what they have been doing on the road. Come and support our students. It starts at the Wally Fox Wellness Center at 9 p.m. If your car is turning yellow with all the pine pollen, consider stopping by Cobo on Friday, 2 p.m. to get your car washed by the Pathfinders. Finally, next Sabbath is the annual Camerata Spring Program. This is always a special service, so be sure to come back for next week's church service. And now... Sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested. was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. So
it's time for the children's story by Mia and Lizzie. Good morning, guys. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> okay, so my name is Lizzie. And I'm Mia. And today we're going to be telling our children's story. So I want to start off by asking you all a question, okay? So I want you to raise your hands if you're scared of something. Raise your hand if you're scared of something. Okay, okay. Does anyone want to say what they're scared of? Like, do you want to keep your hand raised if you want to say what you're scared of? No? Oh, okay. Spiders. Oh, yeah. Oh, you want to say? Do you want to say? Yeah. Um, I thought we could do everything but mosquito bites, but we can. Oh. Yeah, mosquitoes can be scary, too. Um, well, Mia, what are you scared of? I'm scared of heights. You're scared of heights? Why? Why are you scared of heights? Well, one time when I was younger, my older siblings were jumping off this high cliff into the ocean, and I thought they were so cool, and I thought they were having so much fun, so I wanted to join them. So I went to the rock, and I started climbing, but then I fell, and then I kept trying because I still wanted to spend time with them, and I kept falling, and I kept cutting my legs and my arms, and I left some scars, but eventually my older brother helped me up, and I got to the top of the rock. When I got up there, I looked down and I was so scared because the jump was so much higher than what it looked like from the boat. But then my older sister took my hand and said that we could jump together. And when we did, I was a lot less scared because I knew that I was with her. Wow, you know, you know that reminds me a lot of when, when Jesus helps us through things. You know, when we're scared of things, he can, he always help, like, holds our hand and he takes us through things, you know. Like, he's, he's our support. And I think, I think that next time when you guys see something that you're scared of, like spiders and mosquitoes, I think all you have to do really is just pray. And Jesus will hold your hand and he'll help you through the scary things, you know. It's really, it's really important, guys. Yeah. So. Anybody want to pray? Ah. No? Okay. Um. Okay, bow your heads for prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for bringing us another Sabbath day. Thank you for the sunny day. Thank you for holding our hands through the scary times. Jesus, please be with us as we go through the rest of our day and help us to know that you're always with us. In your holy name, amen. <laughs> Good morning, church. That was a weak good morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. Okay, that's better. The NAD offering reading for this morning is about the stewardship of time. We manage time for Christ and balance time for daily endeavors. Matthew 22, verse 37 and 39 show us how to prioritize our time. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Then love your neighbor as yourself. Time with Jesus comes first. Our devotional life and personal commitments is essential to learning to love God and one another. Out of one's daily devotional life comes the strength to make it through the day. How is this done, somebody asks. I can tell you. <laughs> Designate quiet time for the creator. Early morning is favorable. Choose a Bible passage to read. Meditate on it. Then in your prayer of needs, acknowledge him and thank God for who he is. Pause and allow him response time. Prayer is a dialogue, not a monologue, okay? Then a quiz when he chooses to respond via voice, another human, or circumstance. Keeping a prayer journal is inspiring. Powerful look back at how God answers and is a testimony to inspire others. You can be an inspiration. Amen? Amen. Amen. Before we have financial peace, we must seek personal peace. Now, somewhere in my Bible, I don't know where, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all of these things will be added to you. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for letting us come here to worship you all together. And Lord, please help us to seek a relationship with you. And guide us and protect us. Forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us of all our unrighteousness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Please continue to worship with us as we sing about God's love.
The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and tremble. Trembles at his voice.
Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Hope you guys are doing well. Um, if those who could please kneel, if you could kneel as we pray. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for letting us come here to your church to honor and worship your name. Please, Lord, um, help us have a good Sabbath and stay with the speaker and guide them as they speak through you. Lord, I would ask for you to please stay with the Pathfinders at the Campari. Let them stay safe and have fun. And also would like to pray for the Kansas shooting and Ralph Yarl and let him and his fam let them um, um, get better and stay with all the families who were affected by the shooting and please stay with them. Lord, thank you for all you do for us and please stay with us as we are here. Glorify your name. Thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, church. Do you guys feel the end of the school year for the students here? Do you feel the end of the school year is near? Is it coming? Yeah, I think everyone's starting to feel it. The weather has changed. You've had your last break until the end of the school year. It is marching quickly along. Summer will be here before you know it, which means we'll be sweating profusely before you know it, for those of you that are local. But as we're marching along towards the end, I thought this would be a good time for the last few Sabbaths that we have to spend a little bit of time focusing on what makes life good. Like, what does it look like to live a good life? And so we're going to go nowhere else but Ecclesiastes today. So turn with me there. We're going to go straight to it. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And we're going to begin with chapter 1, verse 1. It says this. The words of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north, round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, they, then they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear is its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. And what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything from which one can say, look, this is something new. I was here, it was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations. And even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. What a great pick-me-up as we jump into Sabbath worship, right? Meaningless, meaningless, the most depressing book that we have in Scripture. As the writer, presumably Solomon, is reflecting on his life towards the end of his life, he's looking back and he's saying, this is how I measure it, this is what I look at it, and this is how I've weighed it. The guy must have been the real life of the party, you know? Like, bring this guy along to a social occasion. He's just going to bring spirits up. And we look at this passage, there's kind of three things that I see that he's saying. He's kind of three points that he keeps hitting on. First of all, there's that word meaningless. He's talking about his life. He's talking about our lives. And he says it's meaningless. Depending on your translation, it might say something different. Vanity of vanities. It's all in vain. Um, or vapor of vapors. The, the literal word here uh, is vapor. Uh, hibel is the Hebrew. And the basic idea is that it's like the breath that you breathe out. So I want you to picture for a moment that you are standing with a group of friends and it's that right time of year when it's a little bit cold outside, you can see your breath. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you can 
Sometimes you can see your breath. Other times you can like really see your breath. And I found myself during uh, the height of COVID really noticing this. Like I, I wasn't really a germaphobe before COVID, but I feel like COVID made me one. And it wasn't like I was necessarily scared of COVID itself, just hyper aware of all germs. And so I started noticing this when you're standing outside, it's the right temperature, the right humidity, and you're like in a circle of friends and people are talking and you can see like the puffs of the vapor coming out, you know what I mean? And you see like their puff of va vapor drifting towards your face. And it's like, oh, I'm breathing in your mouth vapor. That's gross. And like, I never thought of that before, but everyone's talking about germs and stuff floating and how far your parameter is. And we're like, now, whenever I stand around people, I'm thinking about that. Like, I'm breathing in your vapor. It's disgusting. Uh, but like, when you breathe out, you have that little vapor that comes out. And this is what the author is picturing. You see it, it's there, and then it's gone. And it just disappears. And that's what your life is. And that's really depressing, right? But it doesn't get any better because then he goes on to say, what has been will be again. Basically, whatever you think you can offer in this world, whatever unique contributions, like we like to say that you're uniquely made, that you're special, that there'll never be another you. But this author, as he's writing, he's saying, by the way, whatever you do today, it's going to be repeated tomorrow, and it was already done before. It doesn't matter how inventive you think you are, how unique or what kind of unique contributions you bring. There's nothing new under the sun, a point that he keeps coming back to. Again, this guy's just a real downer, but he caps it off at the end here with, you'll be forgotten in the end. It reminds me of a, uh, of a Banksy quote. I think I have the, the shot here. If you can put that on the screen, it's a little balloon. There you go. It says, I mean, they say that you die twice, one time when, you're, when you stop breathing, and the second time, a bit later on, when somebody says your name for the last time. It's deep, right? That's kind of what the author's saying, that at some point, someone will say your name for the last time after you're gone, and you'll be forgotten, forever gone. So happy Sabbath. <laughs> Have a good life because this is all you got for the brief vapor that you are. You know, the whole spirit of this kind of brings back for me some, uh, some 2012 vibes. And this, this predates me, but some of you staff were here. And I heard this the first time that I arrived, the infamous class, I, I think of 2012, am I saying this right? That this was the year that there was the Mayan calendar prediction about the end of the world, or I should say the mistaken prediction about the Mayan calendar. It's not really what the Mayans said, but whatever. Uh, and, and so they, they wanted their, um, their class motto, or their class, was it their aim or motto, one of those things, to be, why try, we're all going to die. And I think the staff vetoed that and said, no, that's not appropriate. We can't do that. But I think we could actually argue for them a little bit in their defense that, well, it's biblical, right? Like, they were aligning with the Ecclesiastes narrative here. Like, why try? We're all going to die. But... Uh, these bring some real questions to us, right? Because we think about like where we're at in life, and I think particularly about our, our younger demographic here, the bulk of our, of our group, that so many of you right now, you're in kind of a transi transitory stage where you're here and you're thinking about your future. Like whatever your stage of life is right now, you're thinking about where you're going to be in the future. For some of you, you're at a good place right now. Like life is clicking along nicely. You're enjoying yourself. Like life is great, but you know that's not going to last because you know you're in a transitory stage. You know that your future is going to be set like sometime later. You're going to probably pick a job. You're probably going to have a family. You're probably going to do these things that's going to kind of set your path for a number of years. And you know that what's happening right now is not lasting. Others of you, you're in a negative spot right now. Like life hasn't been great. For whatever reason, the circumstances are not ideal and you're not enjoying the space that you're in right now. But you have that hope of a future. And that's the thing that we have hope, right? Like we, usually when we have hope, we have this, this idea that something's going to change from how it is now. And so you look to your future and you say, well, I'm not where I wanna be right now, but I think I will be one day. I'm going to make these choices. I'm going to go to this place. I'm going to make these decisions. And this is when life's going to get better. But then you read something like this. And what's depressing is you read it from the guy who really reached the stars. You know? 
Like when you think about like all your hopes and dreams and all the places that you want to go, this is the guy that got there, the guy with top success, and yet he doesn't feel anything good. He doesn't feel that sense of accomplishment. He doesn't feel the sense that he has arrived at the good place. And it starts to make you question as you look into your future, where you're headed, how can you know that you're headed towards the right place? Like, will your life be one of meaning and value and happiness, or will it end in a different kind of way? Some of you are not in that stage because some of you have kind of gone a little bit farther. You're, you're a little bit more advanced in your years. Some of you a lot more advanced in your years. You know who you are. And so, so for some of you, you're at different stages as well because some of you, maybe you're looking back at your life and it's not all you wanted it to be. Like maybe you think back to your high school years and you had dreams and hopes and visions of where you were going to be and you actually never got there. And so maybe you can kind of resonate with that a little bit, that sense of like, man, life is a struggle. Life isn't what I thought it was going to be. But others of you have reached that place. Like you're in a place where maybe you've kind of, maybe you've exceeded your vision, right? Like maybe you've gotten to a place where you've had some accomplishments. Maybe you've actually achieved some kind of status in your job. And we don't like to say that we value status, but deep down inside we do. And so you kind of feel good about that. And maybe you've reached a place of stability and you're feeling great about the family that you have. And you feel like you're going to leave a good legacy behind. And so you're feeling like life is good. But the scary part about this text to me is that I imagine that Solomon did too. I imagine that Solomon at the peak of his life at some point felt like, Life is how it was meant to be. I've reached the stars. What else can there be? But then when he gets to the end of his life, he looks back and has a totally different feeling, which is to say that we're all in the same boat. At any moment, we could find ourselves in that state of questioning whether we've lived a good life. At any state, we could start questioning whether we really have a life of value, and we can feel good with the life that we lived. So I want to have you do a uh, quick exercise. We have everyone stand up. Everyone stand up. This is in case you were falling asleep already, okay? So now you're awake. Stand up. And I'm going to have you point in a direction, okay? And we're all going to point in the same direction at the same time. Uh, But what I need you to do, when I I want you to think about it first. I want you to make your decision in your head where you're going to point, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to point due north, all right? You got that in your head? Wait, wait, not, not yet, not yet, not yet. Due north, okay? And um, some of you are doing like never eat shredded wheat. Okay, got it. Okay, on the count of three, one, two, three, point north. <laughs> We're all over the place. All right, sit down, sit down, sit down. <laughs> and maybe get out your phones and pull out the, uh, the compass. <laughs> Here's the point. You'll notice that we go into different kinds of directions, right? We have different kinds of things that's governing where we're pointing. Some of us are going back to where we saw the sunrise this morning. We're picturing it in the sky, where to go. Some of us are picturing the Google map and how the church is oriented. Some of us are thinking like the highway, north, south, how do we align with the highway? But we end up pointing in different directions. And this is the issue with our life. Like sometimes we think we know where we're headed. Like, we think that we have our vision locked down. We think we know that this is how my life is to play out. But in the end, if we're marching in the wrong direction, if we've aligned our lives with the wrong thing, we may get to the place where we thought we were going and realize it's not where we meant to be. We might get to the end of the life and be facing down our own death and looking at our own mortality, looking backwards at the path we've lived on and wonder, could I have done it better. Let me look at another passage. If you uh, flip in your, script, in your Bible, uh, the idea of, of Solomon's success, we find a description in 1 Kings chapter 10. And in 1 Kings chapter 10, we see a list of sort of his accomplishments. And looking in verse 23 and following, it says, King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. The whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom of God that God had put in his heart. Year after year, everyone who came brought a gift, articles of silver and gold, robes and weapons and spices and horses and mules. 
Then it says in verse 26, Solomon accumulated chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, which he kept in the chariot cities and also with him in Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar as plentiful as sycamore fig trees in the foothills. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Kew. The royal merchants purchased them from Kew at the current price. And then it goes on that it talks about in the next chapter how many wives uh, he had and how many concubines he had. And basically, Solomon had just acquired quite a few things. And here's what's interesting is I feel like this is where we often go to when we talk about who Solomon was. I've often thought about this fact that, man, Solomon was the greatest king. And he acquired all of this wealth, so much so that silver was just seen as completely common. And I've seen this verse used as a way of describing his success. But then when you read throughout Scripture, you start to realize this verse is actually pointing in a different direction. It's pointing back to Deut Deuteronomy. So turn to Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16. And you see God talking to the Israelites about the kings that will be and says this, the king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. And then the next verse, or not. <laughs> the next verse then talks about how you're not supposed to acquire lots of wives and you're not supposed to store gold for yourself. And you start to realize what's actually happening here is the very thing that we've often described as Solomon's success were the very things that God warned the kings not to do. The very way that he was aligning his life due north was actually the complete opposite direction of where Jesus was pointing him, where God was pointing him. And it's striking to me that even in retrospect, as we look back on Solomon's life, oftentimes we're the ones that are saying, man, look at where he was. He just sort of lost track of his thankfulness towards God. But look at what he was able to acquire during the time when God's blessing was over him. Or was it over him? Because he was doing exactly the opposite of what God wanted. Which then begs the question for us. Is it possible that we can do the same thing? Is it possible that sometimes we get misaligned and we lose the direction, the path that God has for us? So I want to look at just a few things I see as like little points throughout the book of Ecclesiastes that I feel like can help redefine, redirect where we should be. First one is I want to go to Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 9. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation because I feel like it pulls out the meaning a little bit more clearly and simply. It says this, it says, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless like chasing the wind. Here's the first lesson. The first lesson for the path well lived is to stop comparing the things you have with the things that other people have. Stop looking at what you don't have and looking for those things, but appreciating what you actually already have in your life. And it seems to be that this is an issue that we face more and more today. There's more reasons to compare things. Clinical psychologist Jennifer Barbera says this. She says, the issue with happiness is that it's often viewed in terms of other people as its benchmark. In other words, we feel happy when we feel we're rising above the people around us. We compare, we're comparing our lives to a snapshot of images like we see on Instagram and social media is very problematic because these images give people the illusion of perpetual happiness. And thanks to this, the reality is social media doesn't give us an accurate perception of other people's lives, and so we're always feeling like we're behind. So in other words, the society that we're living in right now, we have so many reasons to compare ourselves to other people. We're always looking at what other people are projecting, either in person or especially online, and then we feel our happiness go down. We always are looking at how the other person lives, and then we question what we have, and our happiness begins to decrease. There was a study that I think kind of showed our nature here, that showed our desire to compare our, our own things to other people's things. And I want to talk about it, but I need two volunteers. Can I get two volunteers? Oh, there we go. Jacob, I guess. There's a slow, hesitant hand raise. You're hiding from me. I need one more volunteer. Oh, Helena. All right. Come on up, Jacob and Helena. So this is a famous study 
that was done on things that we have, um, particularly with money. And so the way this works is that we have two people in our study, and we have $10 for both of them, okay? Well, just $10 to split between the two of you, so don't get too excited. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Shouldn't take me this long to count just $10, okay. So $10, and the way it works is participant number one gets to decide how much she's gonna split. So Helena has to split this with Jacob. But in the study, and we're gonna, I'm gonna kind of manipulate this a little bit, in the study it would be her choice to decide how much she gets and how much Jacob gets. So let me just ask you actually, how much would you do if you were to just decide how much you get and how much he gets? I'd put it in half. 50-50, that's a very fair, equitable way to do it. And some people do do that, right? Like, okay, well, it's two of us, 50-50. Some people though say, wait a second, I'm in the driver's seat here, so let's do it 80-20. So I'll take $8, and then we'll give Jacob $2. Okay, now, Jacob, how do you feel about this? Um, this is a little unfair. It's a little bit unfair, right? So here's the thing. In the study, person number two had a power position that they could play. They got to decide whether to accept the gift of $2 or, or they could return it, not take it. But then if you don't take your $2, Helena also doesn't get her $8. So you get to deny $2, but you also get to deny her $8. Now how do you feel? Well, I would just take the $2. You would just take the $2? <laughs> the Helena knows where I live. <laughs> <laughs> so over and over again in the study, what they found is that more people than not would choose not to take the $2. They would reject it in spite to make this person not get the $8, even though it creates a loss for both of them. Okay, you can both sit down. Thank you, guys. I'll give you your $10 later. So yeah, give them a hand. There you go. It's such a hesitant hand, a little delicate. But do you see where this kind of comes into the way that we live? Like the frustration is, wait a second, I just got $2, which is always good, right? If you're walking down the street and you come across $2, that's a fantastic day. I'm going to pick that up every single time. But the frustration is, is that when you realize you're getting denied more money because of this person over here collecting $8, you're looking with jealousy over towards them, and it decreases that happiness. It robs you of something that you would have had otherwise. And so one of the lessons in Ecclesiastes is when we want meaning in life, when we want to live the good life, when we want to have happiness in life, we have to stop glancing at the people around us. The other question has to do with money itself. So one thing, this is about money, but it's only about money in terms of comparing it to other people. But sometimes there's also this idea of, of not just money, but accomplishment, status, the things that we're trying to chase after, whether those things can actually deliver in what we think they can. There's a study out by, not too long ago by Harvard sampled a number of participants with, quote, more prestigious jobs and more money than most people, and they found that these people were no happier in their lives than others. And here's what they unpacked with this. They said, the notion that you'll be satisfied if you chase a money-oriented achievement, like a big promotion or a dollar figure in your 401k, that it pushes, the problem with it is that it pushes the happiness into the future as always out of reach. Now, the problem with this approach, they say, is that the life will pass you by before you ever meet your goals. So in other words, what they were saying is that they were looking at successful people, and they were looking at the things that they were driving after, that they were chasing after, and they found that for most of them, things were always kind of beyond the reach. There was always one more level to attain. There was always one more place to go. There was always one more layer of security to be at. That's not saying that it's wrong to chase after success, right? It's not saying that it's wrong to try to be motivated to do well in whatever your chosen path is. But when you're thinking that your actual goal in life is to reach a certain level of status, whether it's a financial security level, whether it's a job-related like promotion status, whether it's reaching whatever kind of goal there is, the problem is that it pushes it off into the future so far that we find ourselves living the majority of our lives in an uncontent state. 
because we're not able to live in the moment and recognize that the moment we have right now is gift. The moment that we have right now is grace. And the moment that we have right now allows us to live in the present in our current experiences rather than always chasing after something else. So then what are you going to do? When you're looking at the comparison, you try to push that away. You look at the other things that we chase and you try to push that away. The other tendency we have is to then go towards pleasure. And Ecclesiastes talks about this as well. So turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. And he says this, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. How many times in your life have you ever like just had a moment where you just simply wanted to have pleasure? Like you just simply want to like kick back and watch a movie. You just want to kick back and check out your brain for a little bit. And you kind of envision like, man, if I could just live forever in this kind of state, it would be amazing. You get to like a spring break or a home leave, you get to summer break, and you think, if I could just live in this status forever. Or sometimes when you get older, you think, man, if I could just retire, if I could just get to that place right there where I'm not under someone else's timeline, if I could just get to that space, I'm going to feel happy there. But we find when pleasure is the only thing that we're seeking, when we've, when we've pushed pat, like work aside, when we've pushed like these other goals aside, when we push service aside, if pleasure is the thing that we're seeking, we also find that it's not going to get us anywhere. So the question that we have to face is, are we able to have a realignment in our lives? Are we able to have a moment where we strip away the things that distract us and lean towards something more significant? And with that, I want to look at a, a drastic story. Most of us don't have a drastic story that brings us to these moments, but I feel like when we look at someone else's story, sometimes we can absorb something with that that allows us to reorient our own lives. So the story comes from a famous Russian novelist, uh, Fyodor, Do Do I can never say his last name, Dostoevsky. If I slow down, I can say it. Um, so Fyodor Dostoevsky, when he was a young man, found himself imprisoned for being a revolutionary. And so he's cast off to prison, prison along with a bunch of other people that were considered to be some kind of revolutionary and a threat to the government. And he's cast off in prison. And while he's there, he's sentenced to death. As he's sentenced to death, he, he, along with a bunch of other prisoners, are supposed to be changed into their like funeral drab, like they give them actual garments. There's this like big processional to this where they're wanting to really like let it sink in psychologically what's about to happen. So they're changed into their burial garments and they're taken outside into the cold and they're marched in front of a firing squad where they're about to lose their lives. And just before it happens, this is all orchestrated in advance. This wasn't actually going to end his life. He just thinks it's going to end his life. Someone comes by horseback to say that the czar has decided to spare their lives and send them back to prison. And this moment is described about how the different prisoners have different reactions. It says once the original sentence goes back to hard labor instead of having an actual execution, when they hear this, one man breaks down crying. Another one starts singing, long live the czar, long live the czar. Another man just went totally mad. But for Dostoevsky, for him, he found himself overcome with joy. And he says this, I cannot recall when I was ever as happy as on that day. I walked up and down my cell and I sang the whole time, sang at the top of my voice, so happy at being given back my life. He immediately wrote a letter to his brother and he said this, only then did I know how much I loved you, my dear brother. All the small questions that used to concern me fell away. When I look back on my past and think about how much time I wasted on nothing, how much time was, had been lost in futilities and errors and laziness and incapacity to live, how little I appreciated it, how many times I had sinned in my, against my heart and my soul, that my heart bleeds. But nevertheless, he felt pure joy. David Brooks, writing about this moment, says this. He says, many of us don't get marched in front of a firing squad and then pardoned. Most of us learned the lessons that Dostoevsky learned gradually over seasons of suffering, often in the wilderness. The lesson is that the things we had thought were most important, achievement, affirmation, intelligence, are actually less. And the things we had undervalued, the heart and the soul, are actually the most important. 
Here's the thing. All of us will have a crisis at some point in our lives. It might not be a firing squad, hopefully most likely not a firing squad. But there's moments where you will have to question how you've invested into your life. And when you have the opportunity to go back into that life and realign that life again, you'll recognize that so many of the things that you thought were so important are less important, but that just simply the gift of life brings you joy right now. And it brings me to the question of where does Jesus fit into this? Like how does Jesus bring us the answer of how to live our life? And it makes me think, of course, of Jesus in John chapter 10, 10. He says this, he says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life, and they may have it to the full. Or as many translations say, that they may have it abundantly. Jesus offers us an abundant life. When we look at the kind of patterns that Jesus has in the world or in the story of the Gospels, everything that he is about, everything that he lives in is so different from the experiences we naturally gravitate towards. When we find ourselves comparing to other people and questioning like what I have versus what they have, he says the, the greatest will be the least. The least will be the greatest. The world is upside down from where you have it. Stop comparing the things that I have to offer are different. When we find ourselves feeling isolated and alone, he offers us a community to step into. When we find ourselves getting focused on the little aspects of our own lives, when we find ourselves getting drawn to our own pleasures, he says, come live for something bigger. Come live for something more. And the offer he makes is that if you lean into this life, if you accept the abundant life of Jesus, is that you will have a life that's fulfilled. You'll come to the end, you'll look back, and you'll say, this was a good thing. This was a worthwhile thing. So the question that I have for you, the challenge that I have for you, is to think about what it looks like in your life to live the abundant life. What would it look like this week to say, I want to live for something bigger? What would it look like this week to say, I'm going to drop some of the petty things that have distracted me and robbed me of happiness? What would it look like to accept that kind of life with Jesus? I could just say
Let us pray. Father God, may you please lead us. May we submit to your leadership so we can take part in the life that you've planned for us, we pray. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said, amen. amen.